have been looking forward to this moment. I mean, the, like everyone, like all of the sessions were great, obviously, but Scott, I've been looking forward to chat with you so much. Um, I love your t-shirt today. You have this great collection of t-shirts, really like, <laughs> we need a library of Scott t-shirts, honestly, uh, that I can choose from. Um, I want this one in every color. Can I have that, that one in every color? <laughs> Everyone asks <laughs> can you arrange where that for me? Shirts? You just have to find them before some copyright person takes them down. Well, some of right. them are like, you know, fun sayings and some of them are questionable copyright uh, type things, but I'm on uh, T Public, Teespring, all the t shirt sites. Another weird thing that happens is every time I talk about a t shirt on Twitter, a bot, a t shirt bot, will tell you where to get it. But it's Wait, always what? a lie. They're evil t shirt spam bots that are trying to sell knockoff versions of these t shirts. So when you do <laughs> go and search for a shirt, make sure that you find the original owner, the person who invented it, because they're usually donating money. To somebody for the reason of the the shirt. So that's a first I've learned about evil Twitter T-shirt bots today. Oh, it's a thing. That, that's it's something. A thing. That's a whole thing. Um, another thing that is a whole thing is computering, and that's computering what we're going to talk about. Thing. I am spending a lot of time right now thinking about um, gatekeeping and the things that were done when I was starting up. I've been doing computers now professionally since 1992, but unprofessionally since 1985. So that is a long time. What is that? Like 35 years of being a computer person. So the what was it that allowed me to do that? Um, and how can I enable people to get into computers as early as possible? And if they're coming in late, how can we be as welcoming as possible to those people? And the question that keeps coming up is, is computering, which isn't really a word, <laughs> we just made that up, uh, to the chagrin of our uh, of our wonderful interpreters that are working very hard. Um, yeah, I'm very curious art? how they how they interpret that. Um, yeah, but we'll, I wonder we'll how be they able to see that later. I wonder how they interpret pauses. So if I say computer ing, <laughs> where that comes from, um, the art of computers is it a science or is it an art? And um, you and I spoke about this a little bit earlier. So I thought that while we, while we shared our slides and I shared some of these thoughts, you and I could tell our stories together. That sounds good to me. Um, and I love also that during our earlier chat, you mentioned that you created a separate WLAN in your house for all of the NDIs that you're running. <laughs> Can you tell a little bit about that? Well, so I have a, a fairly complicated home network uh, of some level of sophistication. I'm not that that good. Certainly, I don't have the skills of uh, of a Hank or some other folks that are so good at their uh, understanding how these things work. But I have two two children who are upstairs right now on their virtual school, and uh, they have their own wireless network. They have their own VLAN. But then I have so much NDI traffic going around with my video. I've got a separate gigabit switch here on the desk. I've got a full rack in the uh, in the other room and a wiring closet just to yes, make sure have. that my yeah. this traffic here is important, right? So I don't want this to interfere with my son who is currently taking a physics test upstairs. I'm also a big fan by the way of wired networks. Wireless is not where it's at. You got to wire up. It changes everything. So that's a pro tip for today. Awesome. Uh, do you want to want to go ahead and, <laughs> and share your slides, um, and, and we'll get started with this little conversation? Yes, I surely will. All right, here we go. I'm going to be interested in seeing how this looks to our friends. If I'm a, a little person in the corner, or will they share them up on the big screen for us? You'll be a little person in the top corner, and I'll be a little person in the, you know, lower corner. Oh, this is so nice. Except, of course, if I move. <laughs> That'd be... So I will stay right here. Yes. Great. Do not cool. move. So the first rule of computers, I'm told by my friends, is not to use Comic Sans as the main font. Uh, they are wrong. Apparently... <laughs> I love this font. I don't know why people are so upset about this font. Isn't this a joyful font? 
but I'm told that you mustn't use it. So I'll use a nice one and I'll make a nice drop shadow. And uh, and then I'm also told that using fonts on a you know what black font on a white background is a bad idea. So then I went and I got some nice clip art from Unsplash. <laughs> but then I realized that that's not what my office looks like at all. So I just want to put a real picture of what a real computer person's office looks like because it's a uh, it's totally okay to have a messy office in the middle of uh, the the Rona virus here. Okay. <laughs> so our first our first slide. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, thank you for coming to my talk with Fleur. Um, I thought that this is a wonderful slide that I would share with you. This is a copy of a magazine from the TI-99 computer. This is from March of 1984. And I'm not sure if you can see, but she's blowing a bubble gum and working and writing some computer program all at the same time. And this is, um, what is this now, 30? five years ago, so about the same time when I started computers. And I think this is a really great uh, magazine because we don't see enough magazines like this. Uh, certainly we don't see any magazines at all, but think about this. Here's a girl in a dress with bubble gums and glasses on the cover of a magazine doing a pro computer program. That's the all, world. Honestly, that all I, I can think into. of is that bubble gum landing oh, <laughs> between yeah, it's the keys. Be bad. Honestly, Just that's like my, the just like my drink is, you know, going to fall directly onto my keyboard if I'm not careful. But that's the world of tech that I welcomed myself into, and I think that that would be really nice if everyone could come into tech where that kind of thing is normalized. So maybe we'll get back to the way things were in 84 and then move it forward. Someone's having a lot of fun with your, uh, your camera there. I love there. it, yeah. There Nobody we go. Nobody gets seasick, it's like seasick from just watching that, so that's good. Okay. So, so what's the trick? Here's the question, the big question. Are computers an art or a science? We always hear about computer science, but we don't hear too much about computer art. And when we do, it's only in the creation of art. But I'm interested in, is it an art? Like, is debugging an art? Mm. Well, when people are taught how to learn about computers, um, they either self-teach or they maybe go to university. But I think we can teach folks some of the basics of computers without them having to go to university, because so many of our new friends are learning things like JavaScript without going to a formal school. So I wanted to talk to you about stories of problem solving, thinking about how one layers their solution, and then a big word called composition that we can talk about, and then patterns, whether you recognize patterns or not. So we'll look at problem solving. You've been a senior engineer for a while. Um, how do you think about problem solving? This is how I think about it. It's just yes, no questions at scale. How many yes, no questions can <laughs> I ask about this problem before I narrow it down into like down what the actual problem is? You know? I think the trick is so when someone uh, has been later in their career, they just know the right yes, no questions to ask they can eliminate entire classes of questions faster. And that makes you think that maybe they're smarter. And in fact, they've just seen a lot of stuff before and they've got that skill. So I like to go and teach this class. I taught it before at a, with a bunch of 14 year old young people. And I said, hey, and actually let's do this. I'll test it with you. Laura, help, I need a debugging problem. My toaster is broken. And I really I'm so want sorry, some Scott. toast. It's a tragedy. How, <laughs> you must be so hungry. I, I will literally do that. I'll say, let's learn about computers. My toaster is broken. Go. And then I'll let it hang. There's a long, awkward pause as a room full of 14-year-old girls go, OK. And then <laughs> someone will say, well, hang on. Maybe, maybe you should just buy a new toaster. And that's a valid thing. That's a reasonable thing That's a solution. Thing to do. Yeah. And I say, okay, well, I could buy a toaster, but it still doesn't work, you know? So let's think about systems thinking. Everyone talks about teaching people how to code. Maybe what we need to do is teach people to think about the larger system. Mm -hmm. So I'll let that question hang out there. And then one young person might say, well, is the power on? What a great question. Like that just eliminates, like it's either on or it's not. Like, is there electricity going on? 
like, well, I don't know. We're, we're, how should I test that? What's a great way to test if the power is on, Flora? Um, switch the light on and off. Let's see if that works. Exactly, right? Yeah. Plug some, something else in. Turn a light on. Like, prove to me that power is even happening. That's a great one. Maybe I blew a fuse somewhere, right? Um, now I'm thinking about the systems. Does the house have any power, right? Some people might say, well, that's weird. He just wanted toast, and now we're talking about the neighborhood <laughs> power grid. Do the neighbors have power, right? One of Do the they? young people, they don't have power. That's exactly the problem. The reason I can't have toast is the power's out all over the neighborhood. These are the questions. So then one of the young people says, maybe there was an electromagnetic pulse and aliens have taken over and that's why you can't have power. And I said, that's a programmer right there. That's a person who's thinking outside the box. Uh, of course, it probably was just DNS, but uh, <laughs> these, are the questions. these are the questions we ask ourselves, right? And I think training ourselves to think about the system. I debugged a problem recently in Azure with, with uh, certificates, SSL certificates that go and manage our secure traffic. And people were impressed. And I said, there's no reason to be impressed because I have no idea what I'm doing. All I did was ask questions. Well, is this plugged in and is that hooked up? And is that plugged in and is this hooked up? And just because of that experience, I was able to do it. So then bringing it back to new people, how do we allow them to have this experience without discomfort? How can they fail at scale with comfort. I think a lot of times young people or early in career people um, don't have that opportunity to fail uh, safely. They are afraid they'll lose their job or they'll be judged. Have yeah. you ever heard of the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I love how you mentioned that. So I, I teach a lot of newcomers as well, and we do a lot of uh, workshops. And then uh, actually we invite the coaches as well as the participants to the, uh, to the little exercises, sort of the icebreaker exercises, just to make sure that everybody knows, like everybody makes mistakes. So one of the exercises that we do, for instance, I don't do it a lot anymore because it usually goes wrong and you will see right away <laughs> why it goes wrong. It's like, you know, I, Treat me as the computer. You have to give me commands. I need to drink this glass of coffee, right? This mug of coffee. So um, give, me, give me the command, give me a starting command. And, and usually even a coach will go like, you grab the mug and I grab the mug like this because it wasn't specified how I need to grab the mug, right? And then they'll say, no, 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 grab the mug at the handle and I'll be like this because they didn't revert like my first action. Um, and, and usually, so it's usually the coaches that start giving me these, these commands and the participants actually see like, hey, they don't necessarily understand how a computer works. Like maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's not that hard. Like maybe I'm not the odd one out. So uh, I, I love how you're talking about that. Yeah, that is the, the trick is to think about how the system works, and I don't think we think about that, and also to think about specificity. What you just described was you didn't give me enough detail to do what I needed to do, and the computer knows nothing. Nothing. It has no yeah. context. Yeah, There's so that when people say computers are hard, computers are not hard. <laughs> like, giving the right commands, that's hard. Like, yeah, computers are very pedantic, right? They want hmm. things done a certain way. And programmers sometimes, unfortunately, tend to be a little pedantic. So there's a, there's a funny old computer joke where a programmer is told uh, by their spouse to go to the store and get eggs and get bread. And they say, go to the store. Uh, you know, I want you to get uh, some bread. And if they have eggs, get 12. And then the programmer returns home with 12 loaves of bread. Yeah. And the, what are you doing? You're so dumb. Why did you do that? And said, well, they had eggs. So you can imagine, <laughs> like, if eggs, then, you know, you can yeah. be more specific. I'm a programmer. Exactly, exactly. I mean, we do similar exercises where it would be a bun and I need to just, and I have like a, a bit of cheese and I need to get the cheese in, inside the bun. Um, and they will tell me to uh, 
pick up the knife but not specify what bit of the knife I should grab hold of. So usually yep. you grab hold of the, the sharp bit and, and uh, you, see, <laughs> you see some faces turn white like, oh wait, this is going the wrong way. <laughs> like, this is not what I had anticipated. So yeah. Doesn't it seem though that people should be able to make those mistakes? They should be able to, uh, to see those silly things happen, right? When I gave my uh, my uncle, who was uh, I think he was 85 or 90, when I gave it to him a computer, the first thing I said as an experiment was, "You can't break it." Now it's a little bit of a lie, but what I was basically saying is, "You can't irreparably break it. You can't break it until it is destroyed. I can always fix this computer." And because of that, he became very fearless and in his 90s became quite good at computering. I, and I feel like when I was given a computer the first time, it was like, be very careful with this and don't break it. And that's, a, that's two different introductions to the world of computers. Like, please break this. I would love it if you would break this. Break into this would be a great yeah. way to introduce someone to computers. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So early on, we Google a lot. We Google with Bing. And then uh, later on, we are able to ask a question and eliminate an entire class of problems. So just from the top of my head, I made this list of problems. I wonder what you think about these. These are all just random things to check. And as the famous American president, Abraham Lincoln, said, it's always <laughs> DNS. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then my son told me I had to put this in the list to see if anyone noticed. Uh, it's never twins, is what Sherlock Holmes says. If there's ever a murder, you're like, oh, and then they murdered it, but he was at the other side of this. And, no, it was. It's never twins. It's never twin murderers that are on the. You know, how was he in two places at once? Was it twins? No, it's never. No. It's never twins. It's always DNS. But these are things that you just know after a while, right? Like, is the file locked? Maybe the files are different. This can be a huge problem sometimes. And it becomes even more confusing when we have the issue of layering. Because computers are designed to hide things from people. And in doing that, they make our lives easier. And in doing that, they hide complexity from people who are trying to learn about computers. Yeah. And that can be challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Um, layering tends to be very vertical and it allows you to hide complexity from yourself and others. Layering is actually lying. You're lying to yourself and allowing it. I thought this was a really cool example of layering. You and I send email a lot. We've all sent an email before, um, but we don't think about it. When was the last time you or anyone else really kind of said, huh, I wonder what's behind this email form here. So let's turn it around. Let's look at the other side. Well, this is, in fact, let me zoom in. It's just name value pairs. It's almost like email is YAML, Y-A-M-L. YAML ain't markup language is what they tell me. And look at this divider here. In fact, this is a bunch of text, and it says it's in multiple parts. And the first part is the text bit, and the next part is the HTML, and the next part will be the file attachment. This is a small thing to see, but it's one of those moments where you go, huh, I guess that is how it works, right? But the really interesting part is this. Because I haven't thought about email. I don't know if you have. But I know you've posted a form to a website before. Before. Sure. Doesn't that look familiar? Isn't that basically the same idea? There's a thing called MIME, the multi-part internet media exchange. I think that's what it is. And that's the format that decides about content types and dividers. And that means that posting a form and sending an email just aren't that different from each other, are they? And that makes me feel powerful. That makes me feel like, well, if I ever was in an interview and they said, do you have any experience with email at scale? I would say, well, you know, it's a lot like 
HTML forms and multi-part, right? And that's how you get past the interview and how you then get into the job. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, maybe I'd love to ask you a, a question. Like, one, when, I, when I joined Microsoft, I remember in my interview process, um, I was just terrified that I would get questions like, how many ping pong balls do I fit into a Boeing 747? I was terrified of the tech interview. And then actually it was such a wonderful experience uh, where, where the, the interviewer would just ask me, hey, uh, I noticed that you're a Ruby developer. If you would start a new project now, how would you go about it? And I, mm -hmm. I really loved how it was a collaborative effort, but I still see a lot of those sort of whiteboardy type of interviews. What, what's your, what's your th I, mean, I bet you'll, you'll discuss it later because I think it fits the whole gatekeeping narrative quite well. Uh, yeah. But what was, what was your interview like? I, I was very blessed that my interview was a sit-down, side-by-side interview, because when I started interviewing, um, pair programming was just being invented. So I was able to sit down with a programmer, and they said, here is a problem. And I had the keyboard, and they sat to my, my side. And that, you might find that intimidating, like they're like, looking over your shoulder but in fact they were being very helpful and very supportive it was almost like sitting with a with a friendly teacher hmm. and they they said i want you to just attach your brain to your mouth and talk about what you're thinking that can be a real challenge and i think that that's a skill that i would be more interested in right if you're a yeah. ruby developer and i'm going to interview you for a c sharp uh, uh job I, I know you're a Ruby developer, so I'm not going to try to get trivia out of you. But what no, I do exactly. want is the ability to give me the unfiltered brain out of your mouth and just say, okay, well, I'm doing a for loop. I'm going to be thinking about this data structure. And like that would be a really valuable skill yep. and, and not the technology. I don't want someone to be given a, a whiteboarding test or a trivia test. I want to know that you can think you can look the rest of it up. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So back to the slides, when you look at these things, you might say maybe you already know it, right? You're a Ruby developer, you know for loops, you know data structures. Fortunately, we have those in every language. <laughs> That's a, a nice reminder that in this case, it's all just internet traffic, isn't it? So this is an encouragement uh, to reuse good ideas, but also a reminder to our new friends joining technology that all good ideas are reused. Uh, Kubernetes is th something that people talk about. Not a new idea, just a really great implementation, implementation of an old idea. This is an example of a hard drive on the left and a record player on the right, spinning disks with information encoded on them in a circle. It doesn't matter whether you pick it up with a magnetic head or you pick it up with a needle, you're getting information off of a circle. DVD, Blu-ray, 150-year-old record player. There are no new ideas. It's the, it's the invention of the wheel, isn't it? Right. So then we start putting things together and composing things. And this is called has a relationships, where something has a something with something else, like a car has a wheel and a wheel has a tire and an inner wheel and things like that. Things start getting a little bit uh, complicated. So here's a nightmare story for you. This lovely gentleman uh, is named Chris Connor and he's a uh, kind of a somewhat famous American actor who was on a show called Altered Carbon. Altered Carbon is a science fiction show and he plays an AI. So he plays a, he actually plays a hotel and the character, the main character, enters the hotel, and then the hotel is sentient, and he meets this gentleman who is uh, playing the role of Edgar Allan Poe, famous mm. poet and writer. So he is the embodiment of Edgar Allan Poe. So I love this show. I love this guy. He, he's an amazing actor. Uh, in America and English, we would say he chews up the screen. He steals every scene. Just an amazing actor. So I'm thinking, this guy's great. So I follow him on Twitter. And then he, he's like, hi. And now I'm like, ah, that's the best part of Twitter. You 
talk to a famous person and like, woohoo, I'm friends with so and so, like, you know. So uh, then I noticed that he tagged his tweet with a location and it says Portland, Oregon. I'm in Portland. Hey, are you here doing a movie? He's like, no, I live here. Oh, this is amazing. And I'm like, take a, take a chance. As the kids say, I'm going to shoot my shot. So I say, you want to come on my podcast? And he says, yes. And he comes on my podcast and we hang out. This is me looking like a dork and him looking cool in a vest. And we, we do a podcast. And he's charming and wonderful, and we're becoming coming friends. And you know, celebrities are just like us, right? So then I return home with the podcast on a disc, and I open the disc up, and I am greeted with this: infinite empty folders in a loop. That is a nightmare. And I can like feel it in my chest. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like. There's, there's so much wrong here. There's so many, many things that are wrong. On so many levels. Like, first I'm like, well, that was awful because I, I interviewed him and it was amazing. It was a great interview. Like, I studied and everything. Uh, but then I'm like, he's not going to be my friend if I call him again and say, can we do this over again? So I'm going to die. This is bad. But then this is me looking for my files. <laughs> I, I look at the file in Windows Explorer and I see that it's telling me there's used up space. And that's the right size. I know because I've done lots of shows that that is the size of a, uh, of a podcast, about 300 megabytes. Where is the file, Scott? It's so Where sad. Is it? Okay, so here's the part that's interesting. I actually have the file. I have the disk right here in front of me. So it's one of these guys, right? You know, I always thought, by the way, it would be really cool in a James Bond movie if James Bond at the beginning would be taking communion at a Catholic church, and then the the priest was like a spy, and he'd be like, ah, the body of Christ, and then they put it under his tongue, and then that would be the end of the movie because he got the data and he just he took communion and he ran away, and the movie's like five minutes long. But no one's ever done that movie. Why don't they do that? That would be. And he I mean, like, oh, swallowed it. how can we oh, get that to the creators? <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I don't know anything about hardware. I know very little about very little. Um, I'm glad you're entertained by this. But I know that there's zeros and ones on this thing, right? That's my level of understanding. So then I find, I go Googling around for tools to let me see the zeros and the ones. And I remember one day that someone told me that a fat file system, the file allocation table, is a thing. So I go and find tools, and I can see tools saying, hey, that number should be this other number, and this number should be that other number. So clearly something is wrong with my file system. Again, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know that there are layers. Hmm. So I slowly make my way through it, and I eventually find my WAV files together on the disk, and they've been interleaved, the left and the right. So every other byte, and I have to actually de-interleave them. Interleaving is like, like if you're looking at a picture, one line comes, and then another line comes, and then another line, and they interleave like, like a loom. Um, what was happening was the left side, the left ear and the right ear, were coming down as two separate files, and then they got mushed together into one super file, and it became a mess. I wrote it all up on my blog. Here's the point. I didn't know how to do any of this stuff, but I knew that there was a layer, and I was being lied to. So once I recognized layering and composition, I dug as far as I could, and I only had to go one, two, three, four deep before I found my file and maintained my new friendship with my new uh, lovely <laughs> actor friend. And then BFF. we went to have a taco and it worked out very nicely for everyone. <laughs> so, so far that was the culmination of problem solving. 
understanding layers, thinking about composition, and then the number one thing that I think uh, engineers do, and I'm interested what you think about this, is we recognize patterns really quickly. That just means, oh, I've seen that before. You ever have that? You ever, you ever debug something at work and someone's just like, "You're amazing, Flora. How did you do it?" And you're like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> but really, the fact is, you saw it before, some years ago, and you just remembered. So, doesn't that mean if we all just failed really, really quickly at scale, that we'd all be able to just look back in our memory and go, "Yeah, let me tell you, back in." 85 when I, you know, like, or whatever our experience was, right? You can't just Google your way to glory. You have to actually have the experience, be allowed to fail safely, so that then you might, as a old programmer, all of us, I hope, become old programmers at some point, and go, oh, back in my day, back mm -hmm. in 2020, when I was debugging Ruby, I remember this thing. Yeah. That is the trick. And it's been in so, my mind castle forever. Yeah, your mind castle. There you go. Like your Sherlock Holmes. My Sherlock Holmes has a mind castle, you know. Mm. I thought I threw that in there. That was very nice callback. I like that. Very smart. That's why you're such a good host. So uh, have you ever spent many hours debugging? What's the longest you've ever debugged something? I don't want to. I don't want to admit to the, <laughs> to okay, the actual well, number admit, of hours. Okay, I will This is a safe space. I will admit, and then you can maybe decide later to admit. I spent 13 hours debugging a single problem once. 13 straight hours until my body hurt. And of course, when you do that, you'll know as a programmer and our friends that are uh, different kinds of developers that are watching today will know that the longer you debug the simpler and dumber the actual solution will end up being. Yeah. Right? It'll, yeah, you're like, yeah, it's like a t single <laughs> tear going down yeah. Flora's face because he's like, it's really true. It's sad because, because it's true. It'll be, uh, like, if it's YAML, it'll be a space or it'll be a tab or it'll be a, you know, if it's C, it's going to be a semicolon. And that's the thing that destroyed your life and took days away from you, right? So I've got a, uh, I've got this Raspberry Pi here. Bring it over here. This is my, my stack of Raspberry Pis. It's a cluster of Raspberry Pis running in a Kubernetes cluster because that's the thing that you have on your desk. That's, that's what you do. Yeah, that's what you do. But what's fun about it is it's, it's like a cloud on my desk. So instead of one computer, I have six, and they all work together. And it's a great learning tool to teach people about the cloud. So I was copying over a file. Let me put this back. I was copying over a file. And when I ran the file, I would get a fault. And it would just go beep. But it worked on my computer. But when I copied it to the Raspberry Pi, it didn't, which is a classic, classic works yeah. on my machine kind of a problem, right? So I started looking at the different files. Now, this is not a typical kind of Umbraco slide here. Like if someone were to screenshot this with you and I, and like, let's do our little, what we can pose for the screenshot here. That's gonna be tweeted now. And they'd be like, what's happening over here? What is this mess of stuff? This is not HTML, what are you doing? This is about problem solving. I literally made a folder called good. <laughs> I don't know how frustrated <laughs> I am. I think I'm 13 hours, 12 hours into it. And then I, look, I made, a, I made a folder with multiple kinds of weirdness. Weirdness. Hmm. I had like, this is bad. It's like, why is this file different than that file? Whether you're doing Umbraco or HTML or Ruby or .NET, diff. Right? Always do a differential or difference between the two files. And you can see there's a, there's a hole here. And there's a hole there. Because all of the zero Ds, all of the zero D values have been removed. I copied my file from the left to the right. And of course, the computer gets to this point 
and says, well, I don't know what that is. And look, it's a bunch of zeros and then a zero D and it, it's missing and it just goes away, it blows up. Do you know what zero D is? What is zero D, Scott? I love the way you set me up for success. Such a good host. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Laura, well, let me tell you. In fact, zero D is a 13 which is a carriage return that we do all the time. You might think about it when you're doing your git commits, right? You know, when you get that CRLF comment and they always talk about the difference between how Macintosh works and how Windows works. On, on, if you make a text file and you say hello and you press enter and I mail it to you, it'll say hello, carriage return, line feed. But then if you open it up on your Mac, um, I'm sure you would never use a Mac. You use a Surface like a proper uh, Microsoft person. But <laughs> when you send it back, yes, of course, if you send it back from a Mac, the carriage return won't be there. It'll have a line feed because Macs don't use that. For a very long time, Windows used carriage return line feed, Linux used line feed, and Mac used just carriage return because none of them could agree. Because if you have a standard and then you have three standards and then you have 100 standards, and you all argue about it, the only answer is to make a new final official standard. So now you have 101 standards. Right, so, that and a git ignore file, please. A People. git ignore file and a git auto CRLF. It's interesting, here we are in 2020 fighting with these things. Well, it turned out I was copying my program and it had no extension. So I had checked a box, oops, I had checked a box that said treat files without extensions as a ASCII file, as a text file. Seemed like a reasonable thing to do, but what happens is it strips out that carriage return because it's trying to be helpful. The computer in its layering and it's composing, all of which is a lie, was doing the right thing. I'm a Windows person. I have a text file. I copy it to my Linux computer, and it removes the carriage return. And the problem was, of course, this is a program, not a text file. And it broke. And it took me 13 hours to figure that out. But this is the best part. It'll never happen again. That's the part you have to remember when you're debugging any problem, a bug is a gift. It is a gift. And even though it will waste your time now, you can then use that to get the word out, to tell other people, to save them time. And to write a blog post about you it. That. You can write that a blog post, you can do a video. Google you can come on a things. show with Floor Dries and talk about it. The content that you're getting out of this, this these 13 hours have been paid back to me a million times over now, haven't they? The best part about all of yeah. this for me was the part where I got to educate myself about what a carriage return was. I told my my 14 year old that this carriage return had cost me 14 or 13 hours of my my day. And he said, what's a carriage and who's returning it? <laughs> like, that's a That's great an excellent question. question. That's a great question. What is a carriage? Do you, do you know what a carriage is, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> well, I don't know. Like, I feel like there's either a James Bond or a Sherlock Holmes reference coming up again. It would be great Somehow. if it was a carriage, like one that James Bond, that, that came to mind, that Sherlock <laughs> Holmes would care would go in. But the carriage is the bit on the typewriter that carries the paper. And back in the day, in the, I don't know, the 40s or 50s, when typewriters got hooked up to computers, we needed a way to take the paper and go yeah. all the way back, ding, and then line feed to like turn the wheel, turn the platen to make, so this is the carriage return here. And that you would pull that lever and go, and then you would turn this thing. So here we are in 2020. There are no typewriters like this. There is no paper. 
But we think about these things and we use them every single day when we commit them to Git and we commit our code. I think that there's two interesting things to take away, and I'm interested in what you think. First, I think it's amazing to learn that. And I also think it's theoretically amazing that a young person or a new person in their career doesn't need to know that. And I think both things can be true at the same time. I can be excited about how crazy that is and how fascinating that is, but also I can be heartened that if we can really hide this, then this won't be a barrier to anyone having to, to, entry, yeah. to get into tech. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. how do you, how would you even, yeah, how would how you even go would about you it? How even freaking know, right? But also, uh, it also lets our friends who are starting out in tech understand that there is this amazing, ridiculous, rich history of crazy stuff. And if you think it's bad, you have no idea. Like, <laughs> don't, don't you ever get that feeling like it's just amazing that the internet works at all? Right. This was a moment like that, like that one zero D stole a day from me, ruined my program because of a typewriter that doesn't exist anymore. 70 years later, someone reached forward in time and, and that checkbox destroyed my entire world. I love my gifts. I love that we're giving Meryl some screen time. Yes, got to give Meryl Streep the screen, the screen time. So that's a pattern now. That's a thing I can watch for. And that's a thing that our friends can watch for. And you'll never, you'll never have this issue happen to you because one day you'll be like, wait, is this a carriage return thing that Scott talked about that day? That day on that show? Did you add it to this list of all of the things that you could go wrong? Maybe it's um, not the NS. Maybe it's character. I go back to my list of things that can go wrong. There's just so much, isn't there? Did I put it in there? I should probably I add know. that. It you're should right. be in there. Not. It is. Yeah, you're right. I should add that. No, I failed you. I failed you. Let me go That's back to only an opportunity to do better next time, no? Exactly. It is an opportunity. Follow your to do words. Better. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. So what could we make then? What's a great example of something fun that we could make? A lot of people get into tech because they want to make something that uh, changes the world, that can help, uh, help people with their lives. Um, one of the things that I've been very fortunate to both use and uh, in some small way help build over the years is an open source artificial pancreas. So I'm a diabetic, I'm a type one diabetic and I have an implant in my arm here with tubing that goes to an insulin pump that's in my pocket that I will pull out. And that is plugged into another implant that's in my stomach that has a battery and has Bluetooth and goes to the cloud. And all of these things are different individual pieces of technology that allow me to pretend, to lie, that I'm not diabetic. The whole point of the technology is to make me feel like I'm not needing these things all the time. So what we do is we capture the blood sugar values that come out of that sensor in my stomach. We capture them off of the air, they're in Bluetooth. We see them going by. That sensor actually goes, hey, Here's your blood sugar, here's your blood sugar. We grab them and then we upload them to MongoDB in Azure. And then we can look at that in a tool called Night Scout. And Night Scout lets me see a graph of my blood sugar. So I actually have a REST API for my blood sugar. Isn't that fun? So now look at this. Here, I'll just zoom in a little bit. I'll go to my, uh, some code here. So here's my here's my uh, my podcast website. So you see my prompt, and I've got my Git information and my branch. Over here, I have my blood sugar in the prompt. Isn't that cool? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's like that's real. SRE for your body. This is amazing. That's the REST API, and then right here, 
I have a Pi portal with some Python on it that shows my blood sugar. And then there's another board outside that the children can see in the kitchen that shows what daddy's blood sugar is so they can check on me if they need to. All of that is possible only by layering and composition. Once we get the information from the Bluetooth, which is just ones and zeros, it just happens to be in the air, we can then put it into a database and then it becomes a, uh, an API. And once it's in an API, I can put it into the command line, into my prompt. I can do whatever makes me happy. That ability to say, oh, look, this Lego can snap into that Lego and this Lego can snap into that Lego. That feeling of power is something that I want everyone who is involved in tech to, uh, to be thinking about. Which brings us to our final question. Was all of this a science or is this an art? What do you think? I want to insert a wonderful meme here saying, why not both? <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Exactly right. It is both. It is both. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So I want people that are that are watching us have fun, understand that there's so many cool things that you can do with your systems. Once you come up to a system, whether it be Umbraco or .NET or Ruby or you know, internet connected insulin pumps, you can start plugging things into other things and make something that is greater than the sum of its parts. And the other thing, we talked about gatekeeping at the beginning. We're all amateurs because all these things, I, t I mentioned I started programming in 1985, those computers are gone. Hmm. So does it matter that I'm an, an expert in an Apple II? I mean, React Native came out like three years ago. Am I, do I have 25 years experience in React Native? Like, I'm sure that there's a resume on LinkedIn that wants 25 years of, of React Native experience, but it, like, that's not a thing. So if there are no professionals, then we have to ask ourselves then, what does 20 years experience really mean? It doesn't, right? It's about learning how to learn. Some people don't have 20 years experience. They have the same year 20 times because they aren't learning, they aren't thinking about moving forward and doing uh, the next thing. They're not improving themselves. There, there, are, there are lost years. I have lost years. There was a, some time in the mid 2000s where I didn't learn anything that year. So that year didn't really count from an experience perspective. But if we apply kind of intentionality and deliberate practice, I think that we can say, all right, I learned from that 13 hour debugging experience and I'm gonna count that as valuable experience. I'm gonna put debugging on my CV as, an, as a thing that I have some ability at, which makes me happy. And I wanna be reminded of our friend, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web and point out that he has not put senior by his name. <laughs> He, he yeah. could have put he could have put the the web, the web developer. developer just right yeah. there, but he did not do that. So if he doesn't get to put senior web developer, I will also not put senior web developer there. I'm going to stay positive and not do that. So I guess my reminder as we get towards the end here, I'm not sure if there's any questions, um, is that uh, it's okay to be a funny little knife that's not amazing at everything. I, I'm a big fan of the Swiss Army knife. That's why the Swiss Army is the power they are today. Um, but it's really a, a lousy pair of scissors um, and a mediocre toothpick, but um, it does a lot of really cool stuff uh, poorly, which is okay. Uh, but as we've seen, it's still important to be a good knife. Don't skimp on the basics. And uh, there you go. That's, that's, my, that's the end of my slides, my friend. And I think that's so, so interesting, Scott. And I mean, when you say don't skimp on the basics, what do you, what do you mean? What are the basics? Ah, that DNS? is a great question. Thank you for that. So we saw DNS, HTTP, HTML, moving bytes around, like the basic understanding that um, how computers work. I think an example of not skimping on the basics would be 
if you're in an Uber and the tire pops, I'm not asking you to be a mechanic, but you should be aware that tires exist, right? right. You should be aware that tires are a thing and that maybe they need to be changed if they blow up. And maybe even better if you have experience um, changing a tire. That's not being a mechanic. That's knowing how to change a tire, right? Um, I know that in the in the in Europe, there's a lot of people driving um, the manual shift cars. Stick we call them stick shift. Um, Good question. In the, in the U.S., uh, there's no more stick shift cars. They're all automatics. So people will find themselves in uncomfortable situations where, like, someone's hurt. Quick, we'll take them to the hospital. Oh, this car only does stick shift. Well, you're going to die. I never learned how to drive a stick shift, right? So then the question is, drive an Uber, learn to, you know, like, buy, get an Uber, learn to drive a car, learn to drive a stick shift, become a mechanic, build a car from random scrap parts, right? Like, what level of expert do you want to be? Well, if you are working at an agency and you're doing CMS websites, maybe you need to know HTML, CSS, and a little light JavaScript. But if you are building a CMS from scratch, then you need to know all of those things and more. But the the basics are going to be still HTTP, setting up your domain names. So I really like uh, as a as a beginner project teaching someone how to make their own web page. You have to register a domain, set up a certificate, make a web server, and put a hello world web page. And I think that's it's kind of like going to the front of your car and opening the the trunk or the boot and then looking at the engine and going huh there's an engine there that's good information i'm not <laughs> saying we're going to be mechanics it's just whenever you get a car you flip it yeah yeah there's an engine in the car looks All good right, to good. me yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good now i know All right and then you can look it up later if you need to yeah so i love that and um uh well, I have, I have a follow-up question, but that's um, a couple of days back. There was a green conf on on sustainable software engineering, and one of the one of the speakers there, Asim, who's a esteemed colleague of uh, you and me, uh, said, "Well, there's this thing that I never thought about, but what about electricity? I mean, that's what powers all of our computing. Should I know about electricity and how it even works?" That is a really good question. Ideally, no, because you have to assume that there's electricity, otherwise none of these things work. But just as you saw me kind of light up and get excited about the carriage return line feed thing, you, as a, as a programmer, may discover that being interested about electricity tickles your fancy. It makes you interested. It's like, wow, that is cool. That is, that is interesting how it works. One time I, I did an interview question. It's a great interview question where I said, tell me what happens when you go to the browser and you type Google and you press enter. Most people say, well, a HTTP call happens. But this person said, the metal on the keyboard key touches the metal on the other key and an electron jumps. And I was like, whoa, like that was a lot of, that was a lot. That was a person who understands and is excited about electricity. <laughs> Here's the trick, though. We should encourage people to care about those things, but they should not be requirements to writing web pages. I don't need to know about electricity to work with my pancreas. The person that made the hardware needs to know about that. Yeah. So if you're an Uber driver, you should probably know about your tires. If you are an Uber rider, you probably don't need to know about your tires. So that's the explanation I would give about whether you need to know about power or not. What do you well, that's think? Good. That's good news for me because I know nothing about tires or engines. Hey. For that. Well, you're <laughs> a very tires. good Uber rider then. Yeah, absolutely, like avid. Um, okay, maybe one more question. I mean, if we're talking about the basics, um, isn't security maybe a basic? That's a good one. I think that the level of security that we get from our friends that are professional security engineers, that the appropriate level of paranoia that they have mm -hmm. is probably more than is necessary. But I think about it in terms of um, the right amount of security as a homeowner or as an apartment owner. Yeah, in some countries you lock your door, in other countries you don't. 
but I don't think we necessarily have our front door open and our windows open and you know a reasonable amount of security. So I think I would apply the same rules that we talked about with the tires to security. You have an understanding of the basics of certificates, why SSL is important, um, and then make sure that you know security is a thing, just like I know that my engine is a thing. So when my car needs to be repaired, I find a professional, I find a mechanic. If I didn't even know that my car had an engine and it just died, and I was like standing on the road kicking this thing saying, I don't know, does anyone know how work. cars work? Yeah. That would be a problem. But if I know that security is a thing, then I can call a professional security engineer when the time comes and I can acknowledge it and build it into my software. I feel like a lot of issues on GitHub are like, it doesn't work. Uh, it would be great if people are like, it doesn't work probably because of, so that's maybe a, that's maybe a thing. Yeah. Thank well, you so much enough. for this conversation, Scott. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, no, that's no. absolutely my pleasure. Um, I, this was this was wonderful. Like I couldn't have asked for for a better conversation partner. So thank you so much. Um, maybe you can get into the chat. Uh, people have been applauding your storytelling skills uh, as they should. <laughs> uh, and maybe uh, maybe you can, there's some 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 questions in there that, that we could both both answer. Um, and we're going for a tiny little break, uh, and we'll be back again. Um, so thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you for your help and for being such a wonderful host. Thank you.